a list. I have a list <laughs> of who's there. So, okay. I saw your sister yesterday on the workout class. Oh yeah. I, I I'm hopefully going to be able to start attending. We have meetings, but they're going to stop or they're going to, I would be able to come. That's great. She's an amazing teacher. Yes. The, it's unbelievable. I'm so glad. For those of you who don't know, we have a Wilshire fitness exercise with this fantastic woman from New York who uh, is, you know, certified in working on with people of all ages and doing all kinds of fitness. And it's 930 to 1030 on Mondays and Thursdays. It's free and you're welcome to join that okay no she's amazing i just missed yesterday because i was busy but i just love sarah oh my yeah god. she's incredible oh my god i just i did this which i knew I, I just disconnected no 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 hold on how do i do this hannah can you hear me yeah what did you do i cut off everybody's <laughs> pictures i'm here no i i can't see anyone oh my god I don't know what I did. Um, I don't know. I don't know what you're seeing. So I um, think you're one. Hold on. Let me try this. Oh, there it is. I got okay. it. <laughs> right. Hi, everyone. Nice to we see you. We love you. Oh, my God. Nadine Brewer and Ruth. And it's so great to see everyone. So lovely. So. I thought it was time we haven't taught women's Torah study or any woman oriented thing in a long time. And I thought it would be fun just to do something. Uh, once again, I want to remind you that um, there's a handout that's also in the chat. If you want to look at the chat um, that I always, I always put out a handout before the class. And when you register, you'll see it's attached. So you should always look for a handout because um, I think it's better if we have text or something to read. I don't want to just uh, lecture. So we li I like to ask people to read and talk about it. So I want to start with a blessing because I think it's always a blessing to study with you. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kitshanu B'Mitzvot Tav, Yitzivanu La'asok B'Divrei Torah to be engaged in the study of Torah. And Torah really literally means teaching. So it doesn't have to be literally Torah to say a blessing. Any kind of Jewish teaching is Torah, really. So I'm gonna talk about two women who are mentioned in the Talmud, two women who lived in the Talmudic time around the same time, if we can believe you know, the historian, Baruria, uh, both of them lived around 100 and, well, it's not clear. I mean, Bruria lived around 160 BCE, no, sorry, CE, 160 AD or CE. And Rachel, we'll talk about, was Rabbi Akiva's wife. She may have lived that long. She may have lived that long as well, but her husband was killed in 135. So she may have been older. It's not clear. And they're both in the Warner murals. I did not know that Rachel, Rachel uh, Akiva's wife, was in the Warner murals. And Bruria is too. I'm going to have to look at them. So these two women. Uh, okay, so I'm going to start with Bruria. So the, Nadine, the fact that you said that, do you know anything about Bruria? Does anyone know anything about Bruria? Has anyone ever heard? Nan, yes. So, Buria uh, was married um, to Rabbi um, Mayor. Mayor, and uh, they. Uh, now, was she given credit? Or was he given credit? Um, he, there, he used to travel a lot, and when he came home one day, he found out that both of his sons had been murdered. Okay. Well, no. Okay. So let's go back. Okay. So her isn't she's the daughter of Hanina. Ben Teredon? Yes. Okay. So she was a daughter of a great rabbi, and she was married to a great rabbi, Rabbi Meir, who um, these were rabbis of the Mishnah. Now, if you know anything, the Talmud is, you know, all of the laws of our But the Mishnah is the first part, 
and then the the Gemara was written after. So the Mishnah was written and compiled around 100 CE or AD, and the Talmud, the Gemara part, which started just being written and discussed about 300 or 350. So this was the early <laughs> scholars who worked on the Mishnah, which were the they were the ones who discussed the Mishnah explains the law in more detail. The one that I always talk about is, um, it says in the Torah, uh, six days you shall work on the seventh day, you know, honor the Sabbath day, and then the seventh day you shall rest. So the Mishnah says, what is rest? What do you mean by rest? What's work? And what's, what are you not supposed to do? And they actually define 39 kinds of work. That's not your typical work. It has work doing with creating or destroying something. It's when you change the status of something. Like if you light a fire and you burn something, it changes the status. It's in the, in the vein or the model of God creating and then resting from creating of the six days of creation. So that's the Mishnah where they went through the Torah. They came up with these 39 kinds of work. It's a special name in Hebrew called Malacha. It's not the normal name for work. So that was the part that the, this Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Akiva were, were mainly concerned with, some discussion. But then the second half was all of the what if part. It's like, well, what if you're not allowed to kindle a fire or put out a fire, but what if your house catches on fire? What do you do then? Or, uh, you know, all kinds of possibilities that were more complex than the simple law. And then they discussed it, discussed it in the second half of the Talmud, the Gomorrah, and came up with uh, the answers and about desecrating the Shabbat you can uh, basically break the Shabbat for anything except three activities, which I've talked about in my classes before. Does anybody remember those three things that you cannot, you can break any law actually in the Torah to save a life except for three. Does anyone know what those three are? Does anybody remember what those three are? Does anybody wanna guess what those three might be? Miriam, you know what they are. I really forgot. Murder, incest, and... Um, and converting. And converting. Murder or sexual abuse. It could be rape or incest. Um, or murder. Conversion. In other words, you can't murder someone to save your own life. You can't uh, sexually abuse to save your own life. And this one is kind of like on the border. You can't you know, give up Judaism to save your own life. However, if you don't really mean it, if you're just doing it and secretly you're going to remain a Jew, which, you know, like the Spanish Inquisition where people pretended and secretly remained Jewish. So that one is kind of more gray area, but the first two are very clear, but that's the, the second half of the Talmud. So Rabbi Meir was in the first part and he was with the Mishnah and he married this brilliant woman named Bruria. And how do we know she's brilliant? Because the Torah talks about how um, they would consult her and that she, the Talmud, sorry, talks about, she studied 300 laws in one day and she could explain them. She was a genius. So I'd like to read about her um, and you know discuss it instead of me just lecturing. So who would like to start reading about Bruria? Who would like to start reading? Somebody who has the... Sue Casa, where are you? Why don't you read? But unmute yourself. There we go. Okay. Buria. It's not very often that we find the name of a woman mentioned in the Talmud. Buria was one of one such exception, a great Jewish woman whose wisdom, piety, and learning inspire us to this day. Buria lived about 100 years after the destruction of the Second Temple, which occurred in 70 CE. She was the daughter of the great Rabbi Hanaya ben Teradian, who was one of the 10 martyrs whom the Romans killed for spreading the teachings of the Torah among the Jewish people. So Rabbi Akiva was also one of these, and they really tortured them to death. It was the horrible deaths, and they were considered martyr, you know, great martyrs. So she... This was her father, and obviously he educated her 
because she was so knowledgeable. Just read a little more. Okay. Berea was not only the daughter of a great man, but also the wife of an equally great sage, the saintly Rabbi Mayer, one of the most important teachers of the Mishnah. Okay. So I want to give you a caveat. This, you know, I didn't write this. I take things from all over the internet. So this is the Chabad version. Okay. And they really extol her and extol the rabbis and they leave out the tragedy, which I include, that happened to Bruria at the end of her life for being too smart for her own good. She's basically brought down by men because she's too smart for her own good. And we'll read about that. But who would like to continue uh, reading about Bruria? Because now I could have brought you the actual Talmudic quotes, but I thought, you know, for the first one, we won't read the Talmud, we'll read... Um, some of the stories that are summaries of the Talmud. Would somebody else like to read? Come on, you're all readers. Somebody read, please. No one wants to read. I don't have anything in front of me to read. All right, well, how about Nadine, do you have? Oh, I see Nan, you have, okay. I have it, where do I start? The Talmud tells us many stories. The Talmud tells us many stories about Berea. She studied 300 matters pertaining to Halakha Jewish law every day, which would be quite an amazing feat for any scholar. Thus, the sages frequently asked her views regarding matters of law, especially those laws which applied to women. For instance, the sages had different opinions about the law of purity and asked Berea for her opinion. Rabbi Judah sided with her and recognized her authority. Okay, so no just a second. There's an entire book of the Talmud called Nashim, which means women, and it's oh. all about menstrual cycle, weddings, sex, everything like that. And, but it's called Nashim, women. So it's really the uh, laws or the obligations by women and to women and for women. And what this is a pretty advanced idea that these men consulted her. So she, to consult her, she must have been a genius. To study 300 uh, halachot every day, she must have spent a great deal of her time studying. And she was a wife and mother because she had children and she was considered a, a very holy woman. So, so far, they really respect her. Okay, go on, Nan. There was another case where there was a dispute between Buria and her brother. One of the greatest authorities was asked to judge the case. And he said, Rabbi, okay, what's his name? Hananya. Hananya's daughter, Beruria, is a greater scholar than his son. So this is also in the Talmud. So already, this is, I feel like this is a, a beginning of a rumbling that, I don't know, from her brother or from other men thinking that Ruria was smarter than her brother. That's not supposed to be because they really didn't respect women in women's intellect or character for the most part. So I feel like she's an exception, but she's gonna, it's gonna bring her trouble. It's gonna bring her trouble. May I just say that that has trickled down to the society today, forever and a day. And then my God, the poor woman, it was her ending because she was so smart. Now, now things are changing now, things are changing. But we look at even whatever your politics are, the way Hillary Clinton was treated, you know what I mean? And the way that, you know, her intellect was not what they focused on, all kinds of other character defects or as a wife, as a mother, as a whatever. So, um, but so far it looks good. Okay, now here's a story. It says she was very well versed in Torah and Tanakh and she could quote from ease. And so here's a story where, uh, okay, so that's one thing. At the same time, this was a very tumultuous, difficult time for Jews. Mm -hmm. Even though she lived in the land of Israel or the land of Palestine, basically they called it. Um, it was uh, ruled by Romans mm -hmm. and Romans had already destroyed the temple. And um, they had just, there was a second revolt. The Jews were constantly revolt, having re rebellions. So uh, they were constantly being carried off. So here's a story about, this is her life. Her father was tortured to death in a horrible way. And now he, she had a sister. So who wants to read about her sister? 
someone. Merle, do you have it? But you're um, muted, Merle. Unmute yourself. I don't have it because my computer died. And oh, I'm okay. Oh, I can't uh, get who, it. who has the text who would like to read some of the text? Does anyone have it? Okay, so I really hope you'll um, download this in the future. So they talk about Bruria had a sister who was spared by the Romans but carried off to the city of Antioch where they wanted to force her into a life of shame to be a prostitute. This is what they did. You know, it's so ironic. The Nazis did the exact same thing. They would take Jewish girls and put them in brothels for the SS and whatever. It's been going on the using of women as spoils of war. Beyond the Nazis, I'm sure it's happening today in certain countries. I mean, that's, you know, that's personal to us, but it's happening that women are property and they're considered spoils of war. So here, Bruria's sister, her father was tortured, her sister was taken off to be a prostitute. Bruria urged her husband, Rabbi Mayer, to take the great risk to go to Antioch and save her sister. And he did save her, but... <laughs> So this is like Chabad and the rabbis saying, he managed to obtain witnesses proving that his sister-in-law had remained pure. In other words, she was never violated. Yeah, I mean, you. so he got documentation because otherwise no one would marry her. So again, this whole idea of women being despoiled was also in Judaism even though it isn't their fault. We know today it's still in the Muslim world, very common. So, but he got witnesses and um, according to this, okay, so then it says they had to leave or run away, go to Babylonia, which is Iraq. They had to run to Babylonia because of him in some way kidnapping his sister-in-law from Antioch and bringing her to Judah, Judea, then they ran away to Babylonia. So Antioch is Syria or Turkey? What is Syria? Antioch is. Uh, okay, right. So Syria. Antioch is Syria. So he brought her from Syria home and then they escaped to Babylonia, which is, you know, back up north. They went both because but this story of them escaping to Babylonia is unclear in the Talmud. Why? Why? But it just says they ran to Babylonia or Rabbi Meir ran to Babylonia. Okay, but we'll go back to that in a second. All right, who, anyone else have it? So, Chaney, I do. Who said I that? Do. Joni. Okay, Joni, read. Another time, Rabbi Meir was very disturbed. Okay. Another time, Rabbi Meir was very disturbed by the noisy, drunken parties of his neighbors. Their terrible behavior was such that they constantly interfered with his Torah study. In his anger, Rabbi Meir once prayed to God, rid him of these wicked pests. Hearing him, Beruria gently said to him, the psalmist said, may the sins disappear from the earth. You see, the word is sins, not sinners. One should pray that evil disappear, then they'll, there will be no evildoers. So really, they're saying we're attributing to Bruria, hate the sin, not the sinner, which is considered a Christian, you know, tenet. You know, I hate the sin, but not the sinner. But actually, Bruria is saying, hate the evil. She was, you know, a, a more spiritual person than her husband. Her husband, you know, was a great scholar of law. But it, she was a more spiritual uh, woman and a more humane woman. So she said to him, she would teach him many times. And so she told him, you know, you shouldn't hate them, curse them, curse the evil. On the other hand, it's really interesting to know that there were noisy, drunken parter, parties in ancient Israel, just like there are today. And neighborhood noise <laughs> is very aggravating. So that's what's going on there. Um, and then there's the most famous story. This is the one that um, Nan was mentioning about her sons, but they didn't die. They weren't murdered. They died of a plague. They died of a plague. So there was a plague in the land of Israel. And this is the most famous story about Bruria. And it's, 
I'm curious how what you think about what she said and if this resonates with you as something comforting or not. So I would like to invite someone else to read who hasn't read anyone else. Okay, Shani, thank you. The most touching and fa most famous story. The most touching and famous story about the piety, wisdom, and courage of Burya describes the death of her two beloved sons. One Sabbath, while Rabbi Meyer was in the study house, a plague struck their children and they passed away before anything could be done for them. Keep going. Yes, tell the story. Do the okay. story. Burya covered them up in the bedroom and did not say a word to anyone. After nightfall, Rabbi Meyer returned from the house of learning and asked for his sons. Casually, Burya remarked that they had gone out. She calmly prepared the havdalah, the cup of wine, the light and the spices. She also distracted him while she prepared and served the evening meal with which a Jew accompanies the departing Sabbath queen. Then after Rabbi Meyer had finished eating, Burya asked him for an answer to the following problem. Tell me, my husband, what shall I do? Some time ago, something was left with me for safekeeping. Now the owner has returned to claim it. Must I return it? Well, that's, very, that's a very strange question indeed. How can you doubt the right of the owner to claim what belongs to him? Rabbi Meyer exclaimed in astonishment. Well, I did not want to return it without letting you know of it, replied Berea. She then led her husband into the bedroom where their two sons lay in their eternal sleep. She removed the bed covers from their still bodies. Rabbi Meyer, seeing his beloved sons and realizing that they had passed away, burst out into bitter weeping. Okay, and now the last paragraph on the next page. My dear husband. The top, the top paragraph. Okay. Uh, my dear husband, Berea, gently reminded him. Didn't you yourself say a moment ago that the owner has the right to claim his property? God gave and has taken away. Blessed be the name of God. So this is how she broke the news to her husband about the death of their sons. She's saying that they were just alone from God and now God claimed them back. So what do you think about uh, and he just started crying, you know, he just was very viscerally crying. So do you think this is a comforting or uh, an, an uplifting response to, or what do you think about what she said um, in terms of her insight, wisdom, or, okay, bye, Susan, um, her in wisdom or insight into this, these deaths? I'd like some thought about it. What do you think? Sue Casa, you're, you're nodding your head. I think it, it that uh, I think I think it is comforting in its way that we each of us uh, God gives us life and uh, you know I I think that uh, not that it would work on me <laughs> should anything happen but I think that it's very philosophical and I think it can in the long run maybe give somebody comfort. Okay, um, do you think she's unemotional about it? I mean, she seems detached or it's just, uh, uh, Jeff, you had your hand up. That type of directive or comment from her requires only one thing. And if it isn't there, it's a useless effort. And that one thing is ultimate faith. If you have the faith that God represents everything you are, then that type of explanation would be acceptable in your mind. Right. But if you truly have a questionable amount of faith, this type of event, the death of a child, shakes that faith to the point where it's not compatible. Or to some people it is. Um, I saw Nadine, you were had some thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. Um, you have to really believe in God and believe that God gives you life and, and takes it away just like that. 
to, to have that mean anything. I was struck by her kindness. I thought that um, she worked really hard and she contained her emotions to, uh, to break it to her husband as gently as she could. I think she went a little overboard. I mean, I didn't think they have to have dinner first and all of that. <laughs> I think she didn't have to wait. But um, uh, in the long run, like today when somebody says, oh, God took back his angel, um, it, it, it doesn't really help. You know, I, in the so end, I, it does. I think Sue Casa commented this. You're not allowed to grieve or sit Shiva on Shabbat. And so I think, you know, her thinking was, I want to wait till Shabbat is over to not. I mean, this is very high level, right. very religious thinking. I don't want to disrupt his Shabbat. I want him to have this Shabbat of peace. Or maybe also this will be his last peaceful Shabbat for many, many years. Because once he knows, you know, it's never going to be the same. But um, she was extremely kind and extremely, uh, you know, considerate, thought thoughtful, you know. So right. there's the holy. You now, um, I actually had a friend. He was actually an old boyfriend. And he was a rabbi, very orthodox rabbi. And he and his wife died in a fire. Terrible. His, their house caught on fire. And his brother, who's also Orthodox, I called him, you know, was devastated. And he said, well, uh, I guess God knew that his wife couldn't live without him. So he took her too. And they were, died on the Shabbat of, before Pesach, Shabbat Hagadol. And he said, it's a huge honor to die on Shabbat Hagadol. It's, you know what I mean? So it was so interesting to see the thinking, the thought process to be comforted through faith, as Jeff said. If you have that kind of strong faith, which most of us in the, I mean, I, I don't think I could have that kind of faith if my daughter, God forbid, died. It's, we admire it and we are astonished by it at the same time. It's like we say, wow, that's really deep faith. How, how, how do they do that? But that is what I guess Bruria was feeling. And this was also these stories about her sort of really elevate her to a high level. Therefore, this Bruria incident that we're about to read about is shocking. There's a shocking thing that happens. It's called the Bruria incident. And Rashi is actually, so Rashi, for just to remind everyone, was a um, 11th, uh, 12th century commentator, lived in France in the 11, no, 11th century commentator, lived in France in the thousands after the Crusades or during the Crusades. And he was one of the greatest scholars and commentators of Torah and Talmud. And he comes up with this horrifying explanation for something. So it says, the Talmud mentions, and I talked to this before, that in the middle of his life, Rabbi Meir fled to Babylonia. And so there are two possibilities. So one of them, as we said, was he rescued his sister-in-law from Antioch and they fled because the Romans were after them. But then there's another one that's pretty horrible. And... Um, and they refer to the Bruria incident in the Talmud, but they don't say what it is. And so um, according to Rashi, so this is like the, who wants to read this? Or, uh, does anyone else have this text? Yeah, I have it now. Okay, so read various, po various, various post Talmudic commentaries offer explanations of this incident. According to Rashi, Bruria, made light of the Talmudic asser assertion that women are light-minded. Okay, so it says, I guess, somewhere women are light-minded. They're not serious and they're flighty. They're flighty, okay? And they're not solid. They're not rooted. Keep going. To vindicate the Talmudic maxim, Rabbi Mayer sent out one of his students to, to seduce her. So then, so she to prove uh -huh. she's wrong, her husband says to one of his students, 
to prove my wife is wrong, that women are like-minded, I want you to try to seduce her. Sexually seduce her. Go ahead. Though she initially resisted the students' advances, she eventually acceded to them. So she when gave she it. She gave yeah. it. Okay. When she realized what she had done, she committed suicide out of shame. Can you believe well, this? They, she killed herself. They say she hanged herself. Ugh. Go ahead. The Rabbi Mayer in turn. Wait, other sources. Read other, oh, sources. other sources have it said that she fell ill emotionally due to shame and a group of rabbis prayed for her death and peace. Rabbi Mayer, in turn, exiled himself from Israel out of shame and fled to Babylonia. So Rashi, all it says in the Talmud is the Bruria incident. And from this, Rashi, 900 years after Bruria lived, says this is what happened. She was, they tested her, she was seduced, and when she uh, was revealed, she hung, she hanged herself, she killed herself, which is also a huge, you know, uh, taboo. And that's why Rabbi Mayer fled to Babylonia. Not that the two of them fled with her sister-in-law, but this. So this is like, uh, <laughs> why would Rashi come up with this? Okay, so let's just read a little more. Um, who wants to read the next paragraph? Um, who has in row? Somebody else want to read? Um, Joni, you want to read again? Okay, got it. Um, this explanation. Okay, I have to get it up here. Okay. Um, sorry. It's okay. All right, I can come back to you for another one. Uh, yeah, I'll read again. Okay. Yeah. The ex this explanation has no recorded source. The Ruya incident? Yeah, okay. The third okay. paragraph, this explanation. Go ahead. Go ahead. Read this it. explanation oh, has okay. no recorded source Forced. earlier oh. than Rashi. Keep going. <laughs> Who lived 900 years after the time of Beruia. It is also surprising in that it attributes serious crimes not only to Beruria and Rabbi Meir's student who allegedly committed adultery, but to Rabbi Meir himself who encouraged them to commit adultery. Traditional rabbis such as Yosef Shalom Elishiv, as well as academic scholars such as Etem Henkin have argued that this story was not written by Rashi but rather inserted later into his commentary by a mistaken student. Okay. Go so, on? Yeah, but let's just stop for a minute. Why would Rashi or anyone 900 years later, first of all, what's interesting is Burya was known 900 years later. She was still famous 900 years later, revered 900 years later. So why would these this Rashi or his student come up with this idea um how threatened must they have been ah. to, to yes. come up with that nadine yes i read this i mean the whole thing made me furious but and i just read it as misogyny 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 um and uh then now and for some people, always, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but, but now that you read it, I think, well, maybe their own wives were having an affair or something and they were just mad. I don't know. Well, you know, it's interesting because I was thinking about the Purim story and Vashti. And if you look at the text in the Megillah, um, after Vashti refuses to listen to Ahasuerus, his, his counselors say, well, if the queen doesn't listen to the king, then our wives won't listen to us. And if Bruria is smarter than her husband, if she's not like-minded, you know, is it like our wives will get ideas beyond themselves? You know, so, go ahead. So it's a cautionary, it's a cautionary tale. Could be a cautionary tale. The question is Rashi himself taught his daughter's Talmud. He was famous for teach, making his daughters into scholars um, because he had no sons. So it seems, you know, it's like they uh, attributed it to Rashi, somebody else. My theory is it would have been attributed to Rashi to give it more weight. 
you know, if Rashi said it, it must be so. But how would Rashi, who had daughters who were Talmudic scholars, want to create this story about Breria is my question. Um, Jeff, did you want to say something? Well, I was going to put a different text on your comment about uh, the Megillah and Vashti. Okay. Because in essence, if you look at the story in terms of uh, Esther, this is a story really about political sex trafficking and influence peddling. <laughs> I'm not going to disagree very with you. a pretty story if you realize truly what's happening to uh, Esther. So, well, that's true, but she had no choice. She well, had, no you know, that's uh, that's an excuse that uh, is made many times for women's behavior. But okay, I'm not going to argue with that. But what I'm thinking is that this of all the is there any greater shame to a woman than you know to prove her her unworthiness than to have her commit adultery, be seduced by a student, and then kill herself? I mean, it's such a large, horrible crime that they have attributed to this woman who we just said was kind, was thoughtful, was, you know, uh, brilliant. And would she, this pious woman who wouldn't even ruin her husband Shabbos by telling him their children died, actually break her vows to her husband? Um, it just doesn't seem like the same character. Okay, so let's read the next paragraph because now there, some of the commentators try to salvage her or say, no, maybe not or whatever. So who would like to read? Someone else would like to read. Um, Shani, do you want to read again? Nisim ben Jacob of Karuyan. Okay. Nisim ben uh, Jacob of Karuyan provides a different explanation that is a closer to the text, um, that is closer to the text. According to him, Rabbi Meyer and Beruria had, had to flee to Babylonia after the Roman Empire executed her father, sold her mother into slavery and her sister into sexual slavery at a brothel to be rescued by Rabbi, Rabbi Meyer. And we're looking for her. Other rabbinic sources also take issue with Rashi's commentary. And indeed there exists a tradition among Orthodox rabbis to name their daughters Beruria as an assertion of her righteousness. Okay, read one more. The commentators explain that she was really able to overcome that test, but God punished her for speaking badly at <laughs> the stages, saying that if she had said the rabbis are correct, but that she was an exception, there would have been no problems. The, com the commentators also posit that there was no actual sin committed because the student was sterile. Those that say there was an act of sexual intercourse hold that Rabbi Meyer pretended to be his own student. It is Rashi who puts forth this idea. He had only daughters and they were all scholarly. Some say that even, some say they even assisted him in writing his commentary. That's why I don't think it was Rashi. But then they try to say, oh, it was really her husband. So it wasn't really, um, wasn't really adultery. But the idea that she's punished because she has a big mouth. Big mouth women are not appreciated at all. And she, if she would have said, when they said women are light-minded, she said, you're wrong, that's ridiculous. Instead of saying, well, women are light-minded, but I'm not, I'm an exception. That's what they would have said was acceptable. And um, I just wanna read you, they say that these are the three things she did that were wrong. She ridiculed a sectarian, um, somebody who was of one group. She derided a student and she made a, a fool of another rabbi. In other words, she contradicted she wasn't subservient. She wasn't acquiescent. She had a big mouth. And so they brought her down. Even if they didn't literally bring her down at the time, the rabbis brought down her reputation by writing it in the Talmud. And even afterwards, the commentators couldn't totally, you know, um, clear her name. They said, well, you know, she didn't commit adultery. And did she commit suicide? We don't even know. So it's like tacked on. The only thing, the other stories are told in the Talmud. 
The only thing it says is the Breweria incident. That's all they say. That's all we know. And then these, all these stories happen. And we really know more about, the, it says more about the commentators <laughs> than Breweria. So a brilliant woman uh, in Talmudic times just wasn't, wasn't able to be accepted, but she is considered uh, a great woman, a great scholar, and we, we discount that story in the end, but it's still well known among, uh, you know, like the Orthodox world, or it's, a, it's exactly, it's a warning. Uh, Rabbi? Yes. Um, uh, I took a course uh, several years back. It was a short one, which was good. Uh, <laughs> I taught by an Orthodox rabbi, and when he taught the Tanakh, he opened the Tanakh, and we all opened the Tanakh, and then he was telling us Midrash stories. Right. But he didn't stop to say, this is what the Midrash says, or this is what a rabbi said, just like you would say, and this is what Rashi thinks. But because the people were reading it, they read it as though it were the Tanakh. Right, they read it as if it were true. Absolutely true. Uh, um, when Yitzhak met uh, Rachel, uh, not Rachel, rather, Rivka, uh, she was only three years old, and we can show you how she was only three years old, etc., etc. And that uh, I began to resent, and I said, it's fine if you want to bring the commentaries in, but please stop and tell us and say, and now I'm going to read you what this rabbi thought and what this rabbi thought, but he never did that. And right. I, that annoyed me as though he were telling lies. Exactly. We have to know because I always look at the text. And so we, uh, we're, you know, we've actually, we're now, we have 15 minutes. I want to talk about Rachel, the wife of Rabbi Akiba now. Now, Rabbi Akiba was actually Rabbi Mayer's teacher. He was Rabbi Mayer's teacher. And this, so this story took a, a, a little bit earlier and Rachel is mentioned, but there are, again, you know, just references to the Rachel, this wife of Rabbi Akiba. And there's this amazing mythology around Rabbi Akiva's wife. Um, does anyone know anything about it? She's pretty famous. Uh, Miriam, do you know about her? Um. She also became a great scholar, I know that, in her own right. Not much more, except uh, when he was found, when Akiva was found frozen on the roof. Uh, oh, that's Hillel. Then, uh, that's Hillel. That was Hillel, I'm so sorry. Okay. But at any rate, no, I don't. The answer is no. Okay. So Rabbi Akiva, who considered one of the great Talmudic scholars, you know, they named schools after him, he was a genius or whatever, but he started out as an ignorant shepherd. He was an ignorant shepherd who worked for this very wealthy man named Kalba Sabua in the land of Israel. And according to the story, Kalba Sabua had a beautiful daughter named Rachel, named Rachel. And she thought there was something special about Akiba. She, um, and they fell in love. And she told her father she was in love with Rabbi Akiva, not Rabbi Akiva, Akiva, the shepherd, the ignorant shepherd. And of course her father said, absolutely not. You're not allowed to marry him. No way, I have a plan for you to marry a scholar, a Torah scholar or whatever. But um, so in some stories they married secretly. They married secretly and her father kept trying to make her matches and she wouldn't accept them. So finally, it was uncovered that they were married. In another story, it was just that they married. And in either case, he kicked, kicked them out. And she went to work. So <laughs> she went to work so he could study Torah and he could become educated. But at a certain point, he, he, he had gone beyond his teachers. And she said, um, yes, go and study. Go to the great you know, schools or academies and study. So he left her for 12 years. She lived in poverty for 12 years. And then he's coming back 
And he comes by the house and he's quite, you know, well known by then. And he's about to enter the house and he hears a neighbor saying to the wife, you know, you're so stupid. You should have married a rich man. You married this guy. Why did he's gone for 12 years? She said, he's so brilliant. I love him so much. He could stay away for another 12 years and I wouldn't care. So Rabbi Kiba turns around, according to the story, for another 12 years goes away. Then he comes back with thousands of students following him. He's like the light of the Torah. And um, it, this is like the story is, you know, 24,000 students, according to the story, following him. And he's going from city to city and he's welcomed everywhere by the highest nobility. The rich and poor turn out to see this amazing scholar. And then even his father-in-law doesn't even really is. And then they see this woman dressed in ragged clothes standing nearby. And they say, they say, you know, get away. And he says, no, no, no. And he brings her and this is his wife, Rachel. And he says, um, he couldn't even read the alphabet when he met her. He says, I owe everything to her. So this is the, and then he buys her, this is mentioned in the Talmud, a headdress, which is a gold uh, like headdress that is cut out in the skyline of Jerusalem. It's a beautiful crown or whatever in gold of the skyline of Jerusalem. And they say, why? Because at one point they were so poor, she sold her hair. She cut off all her oh, hair wow. and sold it in order to support them. Aww. So this story, and there are mentions of, of this Rachel and Akiva in the Talmud, is like, compare her to Bruria. <laughs> She wasn't a scholar. She was a beautiful, rich girl who gave it all up for a rabbi. You know, I mean, the tradition of the woman supporting the scholarly rabbi is still happening in Jerusalem today, you know, where she does the work and he's studying. Yep. And um, then when scholars went to look at the story, they say, they don't even know if this, that this can't even be true. And so I want to look at this section. It's called um, from a, a comprehensive encyclopedia of Jew from the Jewish Women's Archive. And they say there may have been different women that they combined and that the idea of her being away for 24 years, which is preposterous, was um, a way to justify rabbis leaving their wives for months, if not years at a time to study Torah. They say, you see, Rachel, the great wife of Rabbi Akiva, you have to live up to her. So we look at these two women. One woman had her own agency, her own uh, knowledge, study, or whatever, and she had to be brought down, even if it was, a, you know, like hundreds of years later and say, oh, no, she, she's light-minded. She committed adultery. She hanged herself. And then Here's the, so I call her the rebel, and here's the paragon of Jewish womanhood in Talmudic times. So I wanted to look at what the, the scholar, we have, what, how long? We have nine minutes. I'm going to read you some of this because I think it's interesting. Rabbi Akiva's wife is mentioned in three separate sources. While these tell different stories about her, they agree on two t details, which may represent the historical core behind the woman. All sources agree that Rabbi Akiva's wife was in some way instrumental in her husband's rise to prominence. He began his life as a pauper and through her agency became learned and rich. In addition, all the sources, this is fascinating in the Talmud, knew that her husband rewarded her for her troubles with a glamorous headdress, usually identified as a golden city or a golden Jerusalem. So that's in the Talmud. Aside from these details, the sources- That's told romantic. Him, That's romantic. That is romantic. <laughs> so he did have a wife who did help him and he did love her and reward her. And you know, this is a, an aside. Rabbi Akiva, Akiva uh, yes. he has always been a lover. Thank you. He lo he, he's a romantic rabbi. He, he said that the Song of Songs 
um, which is in the Bible. He said, all the Torah, all the Bible is holy, but the Song of Songs is the Holy of Holies. And the Song of Songs is basically seven chapters about romantic love between a man and a woman. They're very uh, expressive. They're very explicit. And um, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. That's from the Song of Songs. Um, Kiss me because your kisses are sweeter than wine. That's from the Song of Songs. Um, so do di leva ani lo, my, you know, that whole beautiful song. So he, and so he was into love, even though the, in order to justify putting the Song of Songs in the Talmud, in the, sorry, in the Bible, they said it's really a metaphor for a love between God and the Jewish people. But I think Rabbi Akiva, he's, he understood love between a man and a woman. And he also said that um, the greatest phrase, the most important phrase of the Torah is love your neighbor as yourself. So I always think of him as a lover. You know, there are other rabbis who have, are more, you know, by the book and by the law and whatever, but Rabbi Akiva was always extolling love. And I believe this came from his relationship with his wife who loved him and he loved her. And whether he went away for all this time is the question. So it says, aside from the two deaths, the two details that I talked about, the sources tell different stories about how Akiba's wife helped her husband and some details contradict them. And you know what's interesting? Now, I don't know if you know this. There are two Talmuds. Do, do people know that there are two Talmuds? There's the Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud was written by this uh, incredible academy of rabbis who lived in Babylon, Babylonia, which is Iraq. And the Jerusalem Talmud is the ones who lived in the land of Palestine or Israel. We hold the Babylonian Talmud to be the better Talmud. We, we read that one, we study the one from Babylonia more than the one. But now they have different, and, and they were in touch with each other. They would write to each other back and forth. The scholars would send missives and learning and questions. They were in contact. It would be like Harvard and Yale. Okay, two universities, they were, had their own reputations, their own output, but they were always in contact or people would go back and forth. So it says in the Babylonian Talmud, says Rabbi Akiva was a shepherd employed by the rich Jerusalem magnate Ben Kalba Savua, and his daughter saw Akiva, recognized his hidden qualities and proposed to him, she proposed to him on the condition that he go and study. And her father disowned her for this. And Akiba was left to be, wife was alone for 24 years until he came back. This is in twice in the Babylonian Talmud. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, also they say even in the Talmud, there's uh, contradictions. In one, he, she says, go study. You don't have to marry me. And one that says, you do have to marry me. And so then there's another one. Well, then they say he died at a certain time. So I don't want to go with that. But they, the thing about it is that in the Jerusalem Talmud, a completely different story is related. According to this version, she sold her hair and supplied him for the funds of her study because women's hair at that time was a real commodity. And the Jerusalem Talmud version tells of um, that she helped him financially but doesn't mention her long absence from home. So therefore, uh, scholars think that this long absence, as I'm talking to you, telling you about, could have been a justification for rabbis staying away from home. So now we have two women of the Talmud. It's amazing that we have two women in the Talmud. Uh, very powerful. Does anybody have any questions or comments about these, our first two women that you probably didn't know about. We have, you know, one, each of them are great in their own ways. One, you know, supporting her husband and, and the other by having, today, you know, we, we admire Ruria, you know, she's shown on her own, but, and we can um, identify with this idea of needing to bring down a woman who's too smart for her own good, too big of a mouth, doesn't know how to be quiet, doesn't agree with the male hierarchy. But um, there's also something to be said for a supportive wife and mother. Oh, they don't talk about their children. I think they had one child. 
uh, who sacrifices for greatness. She saw him as somebody great, and he was great. He was one of the greatest rabbis, and it wouldn't, he wouldn't have reached his potential if she hadn't supported him. So we can't discount Rachel's contribution and sacrifice either. So anybody want to say anything or ask anything or yes, Merle. I was just thinking about that. She, the story that she cut her hair that and you know, to provide money for him to study and that women's hair was valuable in those days. Now women grow their hair long enough to have it cut and sent for wigs for, for women with cancer. That's right. But, and, you know, just, I, I mean, I don't know if there's a correlation there. It just kind of, well, really, it's like all you have is your body. That's what it really right. says to me. As a woman, you have no property. You have no, at those times, no rights. You didn't own anything. For thousands of years, if you married your husband, uh, all your possessions went to your husband. He even owned your children. You know, you had nothing. All she had was her hair to use to earn money. Yes, Ruth. And now it's covered up. In the, in the very religious communities. They cover their hair so only their husband will see it. That's right. Yeah. So I don't understand the significance of that particularly. Well, you know, I'll tell you something interesting. Well, modesty, women always covered their hair. You know, I mean, in a lot of cultures, once you married, modesty, you covered your hair because it was such a <clears throat> enticing thing. But I heard <laughs> that the reason that women wore wigs, and I, I mean, I heard this, that in Europe during the pogroms, you could pick out a Jewish woman if she was wearing a head covering. But if she was wearing a wig, they didn't know she was necessarily Jewish. She had, I mean, she had something so that you couldn't pick her off and rape her or kill her or whatever. The wig was kind of a, a safety thing as opposed to just wearing a scarf, you know, or a hat, you know, that you usually wore. I, it makes sense. I, I don't know how you research something like that, but that's what I had read somewhere and it makes sense to me that that may be a possibility. So uh, any other comments or questions about Rachel and Bruria who you know, now know about and uh, they're amazing women. And next time we'll be going into like medieval medieval world to look at some. And in the future, by the way, there is a woman in the 18th century who was a Hasidic Rebbe, a woman, Hasidic Rebbe. We'll talk, be talking about her as well. And other interesting uh, women that we should know about because we come from a very wonderful heritage of Jewish women. Just most people never get to learn about them. Uh, Rabbi? Yes. Um, before we begin to find all the reasons maybe even some agree with the men that they could find against Rachel and Bruria in order to take them down, especially Bruria, who was a true scholar. Um, and she was this and she was that. And we might as well say the men were threatened and therefore they made up all the things they could possibly make up that could sound believable. So before we believe them, against women, uh, uh, look at Trump, what he had to say about women, look at others that they have to say about women. Before we believe it, we might as well look at the, um, the person who's talking. That That's we right. We concentrate on the person who is speaking against them, not on anything that they need to make up in their head that was either true or not true. Exactly. But I mean, I agree with you, but that's why I try to get multiple sources and look at the different, look at the texts and whatever. And we know Rachel helped Akiva and we know Bruria was a great scholar, smarter than many men. And there's no discussion of adultery at all. That's 900 years later. So we can throw that out as far as concerned. <laughs> So I want to wish you all a happy Purim. I hope you'll watch the Purim thing on two, Thursday night. It's going to be hilarious. Don't miss it. 9, 7, 30 p.m. This amazing Purim show that we've created. And I wish you Shabbat Shalom and have a beautiful week. Thank, thank you thanks, so much. Susan. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. I want to thank you. I was going to ask one question. Being single, is it true that we could still be like Esther and 
We can think about our future husband and do things now to prosper him, even though we haven't met him yet. Why not? <laughs> I mean, yeah. do things to, for your, your future. Leave it in no. Hashem's hands, right? <laughs> There's no age parameter for that. Exactly. I love you, Miriam. Hi, Miriam. I miss you. Hi, Donna. Good to see you, dear. It's good to see you, too. Bye. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank Nez. you. Thank, Thank you. Everybody. Bye. Susan? Oh, she's gone. Okay. Something I want to ask her privately, Jeff, did you can hear. Jeff, are you listening or are you busy eating? I am listening. I'm sorry. Oh. What did you okay. say, Brian? I was going to say that Susan said the word AG a few times, which is very surprising to me. Because Jews and rabbis and knowledgeable Jews never say AG, which means the year of our Lord. We always say CE, common era, and the time before that is BCE, before the common era. It does coincide with the Jesus' birth, but we don't. Except Jesus, which is very simple, simply don't. And um, and we do not say A.D., Anno Domini. Anno So I did want to ask her in front of the class, but I do want to ask her why she suddenly said that more than once today, several times. And she suddenly said it. I never heard her say it before. I'm just curious, and I'll find a moment privacy sometimes 